morning. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you. We have a, just a two-hour program because the House of Representatives is in session today, uh, coming up, including work on surface transportation. C-SPAN's Washington Journal will be back tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Eastern Time for a full three-hour program. Lots more discussion about the Supreme Court's decision on the Affordable Care Act. Thanks for being with us. The House will be in order. Prayer will be offered by our chaplain, Father Conway. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. As this House adjourns in anticipation of Independence Day, we ask your special blessing upon our nation. We have many things to be thankful for and ask that you send your spirit that we might continue to live our freedoms with responsibility and integrity. Help us to be truly grateful for what we have and generous as well. Bless the members of this assembly and their families in the time they have together at home so that when they return they are rested and energized to take on the important work that faces them concerning our economy and national security in today's world. These have been historic days. Issues of grave importance have been decided and much commentary and argument has ensued. Bless our nation and its citizens, especially those whose energy and emotions are stirred with equanimity, goodwill, and an abiding trust that in time our nation will emerge into an even greater future as it has so many times before. Give us the faith to believe and increase our trust in you. May all that is done this day be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Heck. I pledge allegiance to the flag. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair will entertain up to five requests for one minute speeches on each side. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, yesterday's decision by the Supreme Court to uphold Obamacare is discouraging for America's small businesses by destroying jobs and threatening families with the loss of their insurance policies. When the President lobbied for the passage of the 2,700-page health care takeover, he promised Americans that the individual mandate was not a tax increase. Chief Justice Roberts based his opinion on his view that it is a tax increase, which contradicts the President as being incorrect. Chief Justice Roberts and the four liberals now confirm the president has been inaccurate. Not only will this tax place more hardship on small businesses to follow the law, but already 12,000 pages of regulations have been issued with 150 new boards and agencies and programs destroying jobs. On July 11th, the House of Representatives under the leadership of John Boehner and Eric Cantor will vote to repeal the Obama taxes. 
On November 6, American citizens will have the opportunity to vote for repeal and reform. In conclusion, God bless our troops and we will never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. Gentlemen, time has expired. For what purpose is the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to express my thanks to Christy Johnson Gregory, who is moving on from my staff after seven years of service to accept the position of Special Populations Coordinator at Augusta Technical College. Christy started as an intern in my office back in 2005, and she quickly rose up the ranks to serve as a Senior Constituent Services Representative. Every congressman knows just how important it is to have good staff, and Christy is the kind of staffer that you need. Christy and our district staff recovered some $3.7 million in benefits wrongfully withheld from families back home in just the last year alone, and there's no telling how many homes she helped rescue from the brink of foreclosure. When you add it all up, her record is reflected in the thank you letters of grateful constituents and the appreciation of this congressman for a job well done. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from Nevada seek recognition? Gentleman, gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to urge my colleagues to join with me in restoring the honor and valor of our military heroes by co-sponsoring my bill, H.R. 1775, the Stolen Valor Act of 2011. While yesterday our attention was focused on the Supreme Court health care ruling, lost in the media frenzy was the story of how the court also struck down the Stolen Valor Act of 2005, concluding that the broad nature of the law infringed upon the guaranteed protection of the free speech provided by the First Amendment of our Constitution. The court determined that the act, quote, sought to control and suppress all false statements on this one subject without regard as to whether the lie was made for the purpose of material gain, end quote. The Stolen Valor Act of 2011 resolves these constitutional issues by clearly defining that the objective of the law is to target and punish those who misrepresent their service with the intent of profiting personally or financially. Defining the intent helps ensure that this law will pass constitutional scrutiny. Mr. Speaker, the need to protect the honor, service, and sacrifice of our veterans and military personnel is just as strong today as it was in 2005. I urge my colleagues to co-sponsor H.R. 1775 so that we can restore the honor and protect the valor of our military heroes. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purposes does the gentlelady from Illinois seek recognition? The lady is recognized for one minute. I rise today to mark the third anniversary of the end of the Civil War in Sri Lanka and to urge the U.S. government to continue to press for full accountability for all human rights abuses committed during the conflict. Over 70,000 Sri Lankans were killed in the course of the 26-year Civil War. The United Nations found claims that both sides committed war crimes to be credible. And although, although the war ended three years ago, Human rights violations are reportedly continuing. Reports suggest that over 50 people, mostly critics of the government, have been abducted in the last six months. Human rights activists have been targeted for harassment and labeled as traitors in the national media. Gender-based violence is on the rise in the country's north. Mr. Speaker, the international community must continue to call for accountability for the crimes during the conflict, and we must urge the Colombo government to uphold its international commitments and fully respect the human rights of all Sri Lankans. And I yield back. Generally, he yields back. What is the purpose for the gentleman from Virginia seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to share my frustration with the Congress's inaction on looming cuts coming to the nation's defense budget. In America's first district, we have a deep military history. Many of my constituents have or continue to bravely serve their nation in a military uniform. Set to take effect in January 2013, sequestration will cut billions of defense dollars at a time when we see so much unrest across the world and American troops still deployed in harm's way in Afghanistan. I am adamantly opposed to these catastrophic cuts and believe Congress must act now. Sequestration threatens the capability of our military to adequately protect this nation. The Bipartisan Policy Center estimated that sequestration would result in a loss of about one million jobs in 2013 and 2014. This is not simply American job loss, it is a loss of critical national security capability. 
Congress must not choose failure over making tough choices for the greater good of this country. Failure is an outcome we must not and cannot accept. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from, what is the purpose of the gentleman from Washington State seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, later today the House will take up a bill that is key for jobs now and for opportunity for the future. First, we cannot have a big league economy with little league infrastructure. The transportation bill will do more to create jobs through public investment than any other piece of legislation that this House has passed in the last 18 months. It puts thousands to work repairing roads, bridges and highways and maintaining our, our transit systems. Second, this bill creates opportunity for the future by stopping a devastating interest rate hike on loans students take to pay for college. College affordability is a necessary step for creating opportunity for the future. The bill sends a clear message to college students everywhere that America will invest in you. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas see recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, here's what the people of Texas think of the Supreme Court's ruling on Obamacare. Jason from Kingwood, Texas says this, now that the Supreme Court has deemed every action of Congress that it does is acceptable so long as it's considered a tax, you can kiss it all goodbye. Tax on gun ownerships, boxes of ammunition, worship fees, mission trip tax, Bible fee. But don't worry, they won't take away your right to vote directly. They'll just dilute it with multiple voting, illegal voting and fuzzy counting. But it won't be through taxation. Stacy from Texas also wrote me and says this. This ruling sets up so much more of a nan nanny taxes and government telling us what we can do and cannot do. Don't buy the right car, it's a tax. Don't buy the right vegetables, tax. Don't buy the right newspaper, tax. Don't buy the right music, another tax. Mr. Speaker, the power to tax is the power to destroy. So what's the next tax from big government? Congress and the Supreme Court have both had their chance to voice their opinion. Now it's time for the American people to voice theirs. And that's just the way it is. Gentlemen, time has expired. What purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii speak, seek recognition? The gentlelady is re recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stood here two days ago addressing the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act and reviewing its benefits. I stand here today after the landmark Supreme Court decision to make people aware of the Republicans' efforts to repeal this historic piece of le legislation. The stakeholders must remember, seniors, the benefits with the prescription jugs already benefiting with $3.7 billion in savings. Young adults who stay on their plan until the age of 26, their parents' plan, 6.6 .6 million of you. Small businesses will re experience tax credits of up to 50% by the year 2014. And women, women who've suffered discrimination in premiums and on pre-existing conditions like pregnancy. Imagine being defined a pre-existing condition. 2014, they will stop. These are just highlights, and this is why we need to, again, focus behind the Affordable Care Act. And remember, remember, it's the largest part of our GDP that keeps growing, and we need, we need to have it under control in order to have our great economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady's time has expired. What purpose does the gentlelady from Illinois seek recognition? The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise to congratulate David Bonner on earning the 2011 Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. Mr. Bonner is a physics teacher at Hinsdale South High School in Illinois. As a former school board member for the Hinsdale District 86, as well as a member of the Education and Science Committee, I have seen how important STEM education is in preparing our students to succeed in the 21st century. And I also know how special it is to have a great teacher who can inspire our students to get excited about a future in science, physics, math, and engineering. Mr. 
Boner, Boner, Boner should be very proud to join the, the ranks of only 97 teachers from across the country who have been selected for this award by a panel of distinguished scientists, uh, mathematicians, and educators. He is a, a, a very important asset to our community, our children, and our future, and I wish him the best of luck in the future. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition? Request permission to address the House for one minute. Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, during the debate on the Health Care Reform Act, the Affordable Care Act, we continued to hear cries of read the bill, read the bill, read the bill, as if those of us who had supported the bill had not read it. As a matter of fact, I among many had read it, and we were astounded at the misrepresentations that were out in the public foistered by our Republican opponents. Well, I'm going to be generous today and assume that they just hadn't read the bill. But now that bill is unquestionably the law of the land. So I implore my Republican colleagues, before they continue to mislead and confuse their constituents, read the law. Read the law. Read the law. Are you back? What purposes does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 717 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 142, House Resolution 717, resolved that at any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the bill, H.R. 5856, making appropriations for the Department of Def Defense for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. Points of order against provisions in the bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21 are waived, except for Section 8121. During consideration of the bill for amendment, the chair of the Committee of the Whole may accord priority and recognition on the basis of whether the member offering an amendment has caused it to be printed in the portion of the Congressional record designated for that purpose in Clause 8 of Rule 18. Amendments so printed shall be considered as read. When the Committee rises and reports the bill back to the House with a recommendation that the bill do pass, the previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2, at, at, at any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the bill, H.R. 6020 making appropriations for financial services and general government for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. Points of order against provisions in the bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21 are waived, except as follows, beginning with provided on page 95, line 9, through level on page 95, line 11, where points of order are waived against part of a paragraph Points of order against a provision in another part of such paragraph may be made only against such provision and not against the entire paragraph. During consideration of the bill for amendment, the chair of the committee of the whole may accord priority and recognition on the basis of whether the member offering an amendment has, has caused it to be printed in the portion of the congressional record designated for that purpose in Clause 8 of Rule 18. Amendments so printed shall be considered as read. 
when the committee rises and reports the bill back to the House with a recommendation that the bill do pass, the previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 3. Upon adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order to consider the conference report to accompany the bill, H.R. 4348, to provide an extension of federal aid highway, highway safety, motor carrier safety, transit, and other programs funded out of the Highway Trust Fund, pending enactment of a multi-year law reauthorizing such programs, and for other purposes. All points of order against the conference report and against its consideration are waived. The conference report shall be considered as read. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the conference report to its adoption without intervening motion except one, one hour of debate, and two, one motion to recommit if applicable. Section 4. It shall be in order at any time on the legislative day of June 29, 2012, for the Speaker to entertain motions that the House suspend the rules, as though under Clause 1C of Rule 15, relating to the following, A, measures addressing expiring provisions of law, and B, a concurrent resolution correcting the enrollment of H.R. 4348. Section 5, the requirement of Clause 6A of Rule 13 for a two-thirds vote to consider a report from the Committee on Rules on the same day it is presented to the House is waived with respect to any resolution reported on the legislative day of June 29, 2012, providing for consideration or disposition of the following. A, measures addressing expiring provisions of law, and B, a concurrent resolution correcting the enrollment of H.R. 4348. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Webster is recognized for one hour. For the purpose of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to my good friend from Florida, my colleague, Mr. Hastings, and pennies uh, which I yield myself such time as I may consume. During the consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purpose of debate only. Mr. Speaker, I ask for unanimous consent that all members have five days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of this rule and the underlying bills. House Resolution 717 provides for a standard conference report rule for consideration of the conference report to accompany H.R. 4348, the Surface Transportation Extension Act of 2012, uh, Part 2 also known simply as the Highway Bill. The conference report for the Highway Bill represents a bipartisan bicameral effort to address our aging national infrastructure and chronic unemployment with a two-year authorization. This long-term authorization transportation bill agreed to by both houses and by both parties in this conference report provides much needed certainty. It provides certainty not only to states and state governments but also to the transportation construction industries and to those Americans whose livelihoods depend on them. Rather than another short-term extension measuring mere weeks or months, this bill authorizes transportation funding for two full years and allows businesses to plan ahead, hire workers, and grow. The conference report ensures taxpayer dollars are spent on highway priority infrastructure projects that support jobs and economy, uh, economic activity. The conference report also contains significant reforms. It streamlines the lengthy bureaucratic approval process, which reforms aimed at cutting and permitting process in half. It consolidates and eliminates duplicative federal programs, and it embraces increased private sector involvement by leveraging federal dollars and local and state dollars with private sector funding. As importantly, it also does uh, w this without any earmarks and without any spending increases. The conference report also extends the current student loan rate of 3.4 percent for student loans for another year. This ensures that young Americans have certainty when it comes to the terms of their student loans for the coming year and because it is paid for, the conference report ensures that no further debt will be heaped upon the American taxpayer. Finally, the conference report reforms and reauthorizes for five additional years the federal flood insurance program. This program depended upon by many, uh, so many in times of natural disaster. House Resolution 717 also provides for an open rule, both for the Department of Defense Appropriation Act 
for 2013 and Financial Service General Government Appropriation Act for 2013. The Department of Defense Appropriation Act 2013 includes funding for critical national security needs and provides the resources needed to continue the nation's military efforts abroad. In addition, the bill provides essential funding for health and quality of life programs for the brave men and women of our armed forces and their families. The Financial Service and General Government Appropriation Act has jurisdiction over agencies responsible for regulating the financial and telecommunication industries, collecting taxes and providing taxpayer assistance, supporting the operations of the White House, the Federal Judiciary and the District of Columbia, managing federal buildings and overseeing federal workers. The activities of these agencies impact nearly every American and are an integral part of the operation of our government. So once again, Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the rule and the underlying bills. I encourage my colleagues to vote yes on the rule and reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman uh, from Florida, Mr. Hastings is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my friend and colleague uh, for yielding the time. Mr. Speaker, I rise to express my disappointment, not necessarily in this measure, but in how it has come about. We're here considering a rule for five unrelated measures the day before we recess for the 4th of July. Once again, we're rushing to the floor with vital legislation that most members have hardly had the chance to read. This rule is the very embodiment of congressional dysfunction. While my colleagues are busy playing political games, our nation's infrastructure is crumbling, and we all know that. Tuition costs are rising, and we all know that. And the economy is struggling. Perhaps if my Republican friends weren't so preoccupied with appeasing their base, we wouldn't find ourselves in this pos position uh, yet again. We could have taken care of student loans back in March when the House first considered a measure to keep current rates. However, instead of paying for it in a way that was amenable to both sides of the aisle, Republican leadership chose to pay for it by cutting much-needed preventative health funding. The President said he would veto the bill in this form, yet Republicans still chose to waste this body's time and defer to the Senate to come up with an affordable pay-for. The transportation bill we are considering has been an even longer time coming, over three years to be exact. While the conference report is not perfect, it is clear uh, that we must pass a long-term reauthorization so that construction projects all across the country can move forward with repairing and improving our nation's aging transportation our system and infrastructure. Yet once again, we find ourselves racing against the clock. Without a long-term bill, opportunities to truly invest in our nation's infrastructure and economy will continue passing us by. Without a long-term bill, construction projects all across the country could shut down. And without a long-term bill, three million Americans will be faced with not having a job after Saturday. Uh, we should not have to pass nine extensions over three years' time to get to this point, and we would be better served than this 27-month extension if we did a four- or a five-year bill. Infrastructure investments are essential to our nation's economic growth and prosperity. This reauthorization should never have been held hostage by political gamesmanship and this is simply, there's simply too much at stake. Short-term extensions put millions of jobs and the safety of our nation at risk by casting great uncertainty on long-term transportation and infrastructure projects. This is unacceptable. Furthermore, while I'm not happy about every provision in the flood insurance portion of this conference report, after 10 years since its last author reauthorization, and countless short-term extensions, it's about time that we get a long-term extension. The National Flood Insurance Program insures 5.6 million properties across every state in the nation. Yet uh, one senator 
uh, uh, from Kentucky refuse uh, to allow the bill to go forward on the most specious of reasons, a vote on abortion. I have yet to hear the senator explain what abortion has to do with flood insurance or why he would threaten security of the homes of all those Americans just to make a political point, but I guess I shouldn't be too surprised. Last night I read where he said that the Supreme Court decision, just because two or more persons at the Supreme Court make uh, a decision, that doesn't mean that it's constitutional. I hope this guy goes back to law school if he ever went. Finally, on today's underlying appropriations measures, I can only say, here we go again. Once again, the Republicans refuse to provide the necessary funds to reach the hardest hit Americans. Once again, the Republicans kowtow to corporate power rather than provide the resources to keep rampant excesses at bay. And once again, my friends on the other side of the aisle, choose to undermine the long-term priorities of this nation in favor of partisan posturing. I've said before, and I maintain again and now, that the Republicans are living in a world of let's pretend. Alice in Wonderland, Alice said that if she had a world of her own, everything would be nonsense. In the Republican world, as Alice said, nothing is what it is because everything is what it isn't. In the Republican world, Mr. Speaker, the best way to rein in the most corrupt practices of Wall Street is to underfund the SEC. The best way to close a $400 billion tax gap is to force the IRS to fire thousands of taxpayer support employees. And the best way to ensure our national defense is to continue to uh, pump in billions and billions of dollars into nuclear weapons that serve no earthly purpose but to destroy our Earth. What part of we have enough nuclear weapons uh, to destroy every human being 25 times do we not understand? In this world, increasing unemployment somehow improves our economy. Defunding essential government programs somehow helps the hardest hit Americans. And cutting domestic programs in health care, education, infrastructure, and economic development while increasing Defense Department funding somehow serves the long-term needs of this country. Well, it doesn't. For months, we've known that student loan rates were set to rise. For months, we've known that the highway bill was going to expire. And for months, we've done nothing but use the House floor as a political playground. Mr. Speaker, our country cannot prosper if every major piece of legislation is held hostage to partisan interests. As Alice said, again referring to Alice in Wonderland, and I quote, of all the silly nonsense, this is the stupidest tea party I've ever been to in all my life. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen reserves, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Webster is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would reserve my time. Gentleman reserves? I do. <clears throat> gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased at this time to yield three minutes to the distinguished uh, woman from Sacramento, former member of the Rules Committee, my good friend, Ms. Matsui. The gentlelady from California is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from Florida for yielding me time. Mr. Speaker, this conference report includes a transportation bill that will help put Americans back to work and rebuild our infrastructure, and it will also ensure that students will not see an interest rate hike on their loans. This package also includes a much-needed five-year extension of the National Flood Insurance Program. This comes after 17 short-term extensions. Mr. Speaker, I represent Sacramento which is the most at-risk metropolitan area for flooding, major flooding, as it lies at the confluence of the American and the Sacramento Rivers. Since Hurricane Katrina, more than 25,000 homeowners in my district have been remapped and flood insurance is now mandatory for them. The average homeowner in Sacramento that has been remapped currently pays about $350 for a PRP policy, that's a preferred rate policy, Beginning in 2013, they were set to pay 
$1,350 once the PRP rate expired. However, that is no longer the case. This bill contains a number of important provisions, include, including a flood insurance phase-in amendment offered during debate on the House NIF, House NFIP bill last July. Instead of an overnight sticker shop for homeowners, the provision allows for the price of flood insurance to be phased in at 20% per year over five years to the full policy price when preferred risk policies are no longer available in the community. Specifically, it will effectively allow homeowners next year in 2013 residing in Sacramento and the rest of the country to pay close to, if not the same amount, they're currently paying. Each year after that, the price of flood insurance will continue to be both affordable and predictable, only rising by 20% until it reaches full price in year five. This provision will save the average policyholder in a remapped area hundreds of dollars, if not a few thousand, over the next five years. Mr. Speaker, this provision offers real savings, especially in these trying economic times, whether it's for a senior citizen on a fixed income or a family struggling to make ends meet. Finally, I would like to commend Chairwoman Biggert and Ranking Member Waters for working with me for their continuous efforts to preserve this amendment and work towards achieving this five-year extension. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady lady yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Webster, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would yield uh, four minutes to my good friend from Georgia, Representative Woodall. The gentleman from Georgia recognized for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my friend from Florida. Uh, for yielding. You know, it's not often that I find uh, agreement with both of my friends uh, from Florida at the same uh, time. When I listen to my friend uh, uh, from uh, Florida, my Democratic colleague on the, on the Rules Committee, uh, in his opening statement, uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, we're bringing five uh, completely unrelated uh, provisions uh, to the floor uh, in this conference report uh, today. And we're bringing it uh, in a rushed uh, fashion so folks can get out of here uh, and go home for a Fourth of July week. And I agree with my friend from Florida on the Republican side of the aisle, my freshman colleague, who says, and this is just a standard conference report rule. That's absolutely right. All of these things that the gentleman from uh, Florida, my Democratic colleague, finds troubling are just part of the standard conference report process. You know, I've been watching this process for a long time. I may be a freshman, but I've been watching it for a long time. And it's just the way things go around here. Now, we've done better. To, to, be, to be fair to this uh, House leadership over the 18 months that I've been here in Congress, we have done better. We made a commitment to bring one idea to the floor at the time, and 99% of the bills I voted on have been 10 pages or less, and I could read them. I could read them. I didn't have to staff it out. I could do it myself. But something happens when we get to this conference report time, and, Mr. Speaker, the question goes to our colleagues. I suspect if we put the questions to our colleagues, and my friend from Florida knows it's true, would you rather rush these five unrelated bills to the floor today and get home for all the commitments you've made over the weekend, or would you rather stretch this thing out and do it right? And I don't would, think we would have my colleague, Would we my have colleague just yield for one question? You can't uh, really believe that it should be standard procedure for us to do a 600-page bill that no. CBO uh, has not scored until just 10 minutes Re ago. Reclaiming my time, I absolutely do not believe it should be standard procedure. But it is. And it has been the entire time my friend from Florida has been serving here in this House. Now, again, we've done better. To the credit of my freshman colleagues, we've done better over these last 18 months, and we will continue to do better. But Ju Chief Justice Roberts had it right yesterday. The elections have consequences. The American people are responsible for what goes on here. And again, Mr. Speaker, if folks want their representatives, because we keep this calendar for a reason, we do it out of a need for service. You and I both have commitments to constituents starting at dawn tomorrow morning. Now, we have commitments to constituents to keep transportation bills going, to work with student loans, to reauthorize flood insurance, on and on and on. We have competing commitments to our constituents. I would just hope that if my colleagues were asked, and Mr. Speaker, if you were asking your constituents, that they would say, you know what, I'd rather you cancel on me this weekend and stay up there and get it right than rush it through. Now, that said, it has not been partisan politics that's kept us 
from getting it here until this point. We've been working hard on this. And the credit of the folks in the Transportation Conferee uh, Committee, they have been working hard. And this was just the best they could do. Getting it done today, for whatever reason, this town only operates in crisis. I say to my friend, if we can work towards regular order, I would love to see regular order come to this institution. We have done better. 18 months on the job uh, that I have, have been here, you and I, we have done better. My colleague from Florida and I, we have done better, but we can still do better, but we're only going to do better if the constituents demand it. Supreme Court had it right. You can throw out the folks who aren't doing it right. Mr. Speaker, I encourage you to encourage all voters to look at what we do, see when we're getting it right and tell us, and see when we're getting it wrong and ask us to do better. We can do better. We will do better. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank my friend for yielding to me. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings, is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to my very good friend from the Virgin Islands, Dr. Uh, Christensen. Gentleman from the Virgin Islands, recognized for two minutes. Thank Good you, night, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, for yielding. You know, after 20 years of being fully and fairly included in the surface transportation bills, what is being voted on today, and what is being voted on for today? Funding to the smaller territories is cut by $10 million. And while I'm glad our sister territory of Puerto Rico, as well as the states and District of Columbia, are level funded, it just seems grossly unfair that only the United States Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Marianas are singled out for cuts. Why cut $10 million? Or it could have been spread out across the entire bill and not raise the blip in the 50 states, the district, or Puerto Rico. But for us small economies, it's a big blow. That being said, it could have been worse. This body would have made our funding discretionary and therefore not secure. So while I decry the cuts, I have to thank the Senate for hearing our pleas and keeping our funding in the trust fund. After all of the time, though, that we have waited for even this two-year, three-month infrastructure and job-creating transportation bill, and knowing the need to keep college affordable and reauthorize flood insurance, I cannot in good conscience oppose the bill before us today. But what is being done to the territories is unfair and discriminatory, and since it makes so little difference in the overall bill, it seems deliberately and unnecessarily punitive to us loyal Americans who serve and shed our blood just like every other in defense and love of this, our country. Fairness would demand that it be restored. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mr. Webster, time. is recognized. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. I'm very pleased at this time to yield five minutes to the distinguished uh, gentleman, my good friend from Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. I appreciate the gentleman's courtesy in permitting me to speak on this bill. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's no small amount of irony that we are having this discussion today. It's on the anniversary of President Eisenhower signing into law the National Defense Highway Act. This weekend will be the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad Act signed into law by Abraham Lincoln. This was an era when Republicans believed in infrastructure in development. In fact, for most of our history, actually, infrastructure has not been partisan. It's been something that people on this House floor could come together to work on. There would be differences, to be sure. But for 20 years that I've been involved with this issue, we've been working to broaden our view of how to make transportation work better, involve citizens, more flexibility, make the dollars stretch. This came crashing to a halt with this Congress. Now, the bill that's going to come before us, I will very reluctantly vote in favor of, in part because of what's not in it. Remember, our Republican colleagues tried to force through a bill which for the first time in history had never had bipartisan work there that came out of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, that came out of Ways and Means. It, in fact, that never even had a full committee hearing. Rushed to work session. Mercifully, it collapsed before it came to the floor. 
And one of the reasons I'll vote for this bill is because what the Republicans wanted has been rejected. Remember, they wanted to take away all the funding guarantees for transit. Working with the Senate, we were able to resist that effort. They wanted to gut environmental protections. And while there, you're going to find there are some problems with this legislation, at least it's not as bad as what our Republican colleagues wanted. They wanted to completely eliminate the guarantees for transportation enhancements, for bike and pedestrian. They were even going to eliminate the wildly popular Safe Routes to School bill. Well, most of that has been retained, although they were successful in gutting the provisions for some reason for Safe Routes to School. We have a bill that actually is a little higher in terms of the funding level than what the Republicans wanted, and it is at least going to be guaranteed for two years. It has some provisions that are important to those of us who have rural schools, Oregon among them. It's going to make a big difference. Putting this extraneous provision in uh, is going to help. A little help in terms of student loan. And we worked in the finance title to be able to have the money come from actually something that's going to make it more likely that we stabilize some private pension programs. So it's not without merit. There are important things here, but the main reason to vote for it is because we've been able, working with the Senate, to resist what the Republicans attempted to inflict on the House and the American people. But make no mistake, it is not a bill to be proud of. It, as I mentioned, uh, dramatically reduces the funding for the transportation enhancements. There is no rail title. There is uh, there will be reductions in citizen opportunities for environmental protection and participation. Uh, it, it is sadly a missed opportunity that didn't need to happen. They could have allowed the Senate bill in its entirety to be voted on, and I'm confident that would have passed. Or, wonder of wonders, they actually could have worked like we used to do in a bipartisan fashion, the last transportation bill under Republican control passed with 412 votes. Well, we've missed an opportunity. At precisely the time when America needs more investment in renewing and rebuilding, for transit, for roads, for rail, for water and sewer, there are a whole range of things that we should be coming together to work on. I hope that the American public looks very closely at what was attempted here in the last six months, they look at what we were ma managed to stagger through and that it is a wake-up call for people to be engaged. I have worked for five years with a broad coalition of stakeholders that's not partisan, that are committed to making... May I have 30 more seconds? Yeah. Well, gentlemen, you have a lot of 30 seconds. To be able to work together on a vision for how we're going to rebuild and renew the country, how we're going to revitalize the economy, and how we make our communities more livable, our families safer, healthier, and more economically secure. If we're able to use this flawed process and sadly inadequate bill as a springboard, maybe in some ways it will have been worth it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Webster, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to remind again, as I said in my opening remarks, this bill has no earmarks. Yes, we know how they did it in the past with six, seven, eight thousand earmarks, and certainly there'd be a lot of support among individual members if that were the case. This, has, this bill has no earmarks. It's good policy. Yes, we could have a federal government says we know all. We know everything that's needed in every single community, and we could stamp out one of our famed cookie-cutter approaches to, to funding transportation, as we used to do, so that every single dollar has a little teeny category, and every state is bought in to, to, to spending within those little teeny categories. Yes, we could have done it that way, but that's the old way of doing it. We did it a different way. We actually had a conference, no earmarks, 
and we gave states flexibility. We sent to the states the opportunity to decide. Did we take out any of those things that were mentioned? Absolutely not. They're all options. So every single dollar we send to the state, the state has an opportunity to say, maybe we don't want to do a, 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 a sound barrier, whatever it is that's, that's there. No, we can take the flexibility that's given to us, we can use it, we can use it to our benefit. Far better to build a transportation bill from the ground up than to build it from the top down, Washington, D.C., cookie cutter style. I'd like to yield through two minutes of my time to the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Bigger. The gentlelady from Illinois is recognized for two minutes. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to encourage my colleagues to support this bipartisan compromise to enact uh, three of our top economic priorities. You know, uh, some people have said, well, uh, we don't like the bundling, we don't like putting three bills uh, together. Uh, but, I, but I think this is the, this is the, the art of uh, compromise and this is the art of the possible. Because the, all three of these bills are very important to all of us, I think, and, and to have this bipartisan um, a way to do this, I think this is the, the way that we should go. I started out with the uh, flood insurance bill and before we even had a, a, a bill, we did a, a, a a draft so that every group could look at it, so that every member could look at it and, and be a part of it and to, and to have what they thought was necessary or, or to talk about what they didn't think was necessary so that we came up with a bill that came out of the Financial Services uh, Committee, uh, my subcommittee by voice, by voice vote, but out of the Financial Services Committee uh, last June. Uh, 54 to nothing, and people said, how did that happen? Well, it happened because we got together and worked before we had, had uh, really said, just vote for my bill. And I think this is so important that we do this uh, and get back together to be able to, to, uh, to work in a bipartisan way. And uh, uh, the gentlelady from California was, was, the, was my uh, co-sponsor. And so, and, and everybody a lot joined on together. So I think that, uh, that it's really important. And, and then uh, actually the, uh, the uh, student loan bill is also my bill. So I really care about what's going on, on this morning and uh, that we can really get together and pass these. And the transportation bill is so important to all of us. Uh, uh, several of us in Illinois had uh, real uh, concerns about how the, uh, the transit uh, part of that bill was going to be be, uh, be in it and, and really wanted to, to do something like what the Senate had done and include that in the trust fund. Uh, do you have more time? 15 seconds. Okay. So I, uh, I really thank, uh, uh, thank the gentleman and I think that it, it took a lot of compromise on both sides of the aisle, but this agreement safeguards uh, uh, the things in, in all of the bills, such as the suburban transit options and, and funds critical road and, and, and bridge projects. So it's been a long time, but I encourage my colleagues to look at the big picture and lend this agreement uh, uh, their strong support, and I yield back. General ladies, time has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings, is recognized. Mr. Speaker, would you be kind enough to tell me the time remaining for both sides? Mr. Hastings, uh, you have 13 and a half minutes. And the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Webster, has 18 and three-quarter minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased at this time to yield four minutes to my uh, good friend, the distinguished gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Gentlewoman from Texas is recognized for four minutes. Let me thank the distinguished gentleman from Florida for his courtesies uh, and his friendship. We've known each other, and uh, his service has been... Uh, one of great commendation to the manager as well and we've gathered here on the floor this morning and I, I want to acknowledge that uh, the legislative process is not always pretty uh, but there are lives embedded in this legislation today and though I have concerns uh, I am more pointed toward this house doing things to improve the quality of life for Americans who stand by the wayside and the highways of despair waiting for us to provide jobs, to improve the conditions of infrastructure and their lives. Over the past two years, we have seen tornadoes, 
We've even seen an earthquake here in Washington, D.C. We've seen hurricanes on the coastline where I come from in Texas and Florida. Just recently, uh, terrible storm Debbie, Hurricane Debbie, has pierced the infrastructure. Uh, and obviously this legislation uh, points to some of those needs. As I stand here today, I, I do want to take note of a comment made by a person in the other body uh, and suggest to General uh, Holder, Attorney General Holder, do not resign. Uh, we have better things to do than to uh, speak to uh, a, a cabinet officer who uh, has a commended public servant. So I, I want to make sure that, that that does not occur. But as I discuss this legislation, I think it is important to note several things. One, there are young people uh, that are facing the uphill battle of getting a college education. Now we'll have a refuge. I held a town hall meeting, and to hear the stories of $37,000, $50,000, $90,000 in debt that these young people have, and they are first and second year, they are sophomores and juniors, or maybe uh, the uh, veteran who does not fall into the uh, schedule of veterans' benefits with college, and uh, that person has enormous amount of debt. And so I'm grateful that we have frozen that interest rate, and we should say that loudly to the students who are now studying that America cares about them and this House will care about them. Now, I am concerned, and I'm reading a language that indicates that while there's been significant progress regarding MWBEs, and this bill has $13 billion in it for surface transportation and highways, there is concern expressed in this report that we have not really met our goals to help small businesses and minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. And in actuality, they have an outreach goal of 10%. Do we realize that there are some that are receiving federal funds that don't even meet that goal? And I'm going to cite Houston Metro uh, because... Uh, I was proud to have this body provide $900 million to Houston Metro, but I'm disappointed in their lack of commitment to MWBEs. And so this is an important statement, and as I read uh, the language, it is adding women uh, to this to create jobs, and we want to work together. We don't want to be uh, fighting against each other, but we create jobs when we help small businesses, and that is crucial. Mass transit has been helped. Uh, but I want to note the jobs that President Obama and Democrats have been speaking of are now focused in this bill. Because as we begin to fix the crumbling infrastructure and the $13 billion that we've committed to mass transit, to highways, uh, to the construction of infrastructure, but only bridges uh, that are crumbling, and those who have now been the subject of uh, tornadoes, as I indicated, of hurricanes, deteriorating infrastructure can now... Uh, be uh, revitalized and rebuilt. So, Mr. Speaker, and to my colleagues, yes, um, I will be voting on this uh, conference report and acknowledge the work that has been done, but more importantly, Mr. Speaker, to acknowledge that legislation sometimes, when you have to pull things for people who are desperate, may not be a process that one says is the ordinary process. But I'd like the fact that ordinary people have done extraordinary things. And this is an extraordinary legislative initiative with its problems, but with $13 billion going to the people of the United States and protecting our young people and doing the business of the American people as opposed to uh, other directions. I thank the speaker. I thank uh, the uh, manager for yielding this time. And uh, I hope that we will move forward in serving the American people. I yield back. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. Mr. Webster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would reserve my time. I could ask the gentleman uh, how many speakers he has. We certainly have two more, possibly three, but we're moving rapidly. Mr. Andrews, my good friend and colleague, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to him. Mr. Andrews from New Jersey. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. Without objection. I thank my friend for yielding. The, the seeds of this bipartisan agreement were sown in the other body three or four months ago. And I frankly wish these agreements had been brought to this floor a lot sooner. It would have done a lot more good, but I'm glad that these agreements are here today. Um, this is a bill that will help create jobs in the transportation sector. It's overdue. It's a bill that will help our real estate industry by resolving matters about the National Flood Insurance Program. That is overdue. 
and it's a bill that will avoid a dramatic doubling of student loan interest rates on Sunday, which is long overdue, so it's worth supporting. I want to commend the negotiators on both sides for another provision regarding pension law that helps offset and pay for the provisions in this bill, because it, I believe, will represent a significant investment by businesses around the country in job creation and purchasing of equipment and capital goods. Under the terms of the pension pay for in this bill, American employers will have about $28 billion for the next year to spend on something other than pension plan contributions. Now, their pensions will be safe and secure, but this is $28 billion that will be available to these companies, private money, to hire people, to buy equipment, to invest in their companies, and to help their businesses grow. This is businesses as large as some of the uh, major companies in our country and businesses that are quite small. So one of the reasons to support this legislation is in fact it includes for this year alone a $28 billion opportunity for the private sector to help put Americans back to work. This is a good idea. It was advanced by both Republicans and Democrats in this body and the other body and I hope that we receive a yes vote for it here today. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman Speaker from Florida, Mr. Webster, reserves. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased at this time to yield to my.